Hi, it's Dave T here, and for episode five of my off-grid mini-series, I'm going to talk about batteries. Now, unfortunately, with batteries, it's very easy to get very technical, so I'll try and explain the pros and cons of each type as simply as possible. Batteries are, in some ways, the most critical part of any caravan and most motorhomes when it comes to camping off-grid as they provide the main method of storing any electrical power that you either bring with you or generate on site. Batteries used for camping are generally referred to as leisure batteries. While similar to car batteries, their construction is subtly different to suit the requirements of camping. Car batteries will provide a large current to start the engine, depleting the battery a small amount and then being immediately recharged. A leisure battery, on the other hand, is designed to deliver lower currents over a longer period of time and reaching a much lower level of charge before being replenished. Two main types of chemistry are used for leisure batteries. Traditional lead acid batteries and more recently lithium batteries. Lead acid batteries are made of lead plates with some form of acid based electrolyte. These are divided into two groups, the first being referred to as wet or flooded and the other being known as sealed, though the technical term is actually valve regulated. The flooded versions are, as the name suggests, flooded with the acid based electrolyte which can be accessed by the user for servicing. The acid can spill if tipped, so they should be handled with care. The level of the liquid electrolyte should also be monitored and topped up if required. This is because they have open vents allowing the electrolyte to actually evaporate. Sealed batteries, as you may imagine, are sealed, so that there is less risk of spillage. In fact, some do not even need to be installed upright. There are two main types of sealed batteries, AGM and gel. AGM, which stands for absorptive glass mat, use glass mats to help stabilize the electrolyte. Gel batteries obtain a similar result by adding a gelling agent to the electrolyte. Sealed batteries are more sensitive to overcharging and overheating and are not user serviceable in the same way that an unsealed flooded battery is. So finally, we come to lithium leisure batteries, which are gaining popularity. There are several chemical variants of lithium batteries, but the ones we shall be focusing on for leisure use are lithium iron phosphate batteries, often referred to as Liffy PO4. They contain no liquid, so there is no risk of leakage, and can typically be installed in any orientation. Their construction makes them more stable and so able to deliver much higher currents, and they require no maintenance on about half the weight of an equivalent lead acid battery. They usually have built-in charge control circuits and can be safely discharged to approximately 90% without damaging them. They also have a far greater life expectancy. The lifespan of a leisure battery is probably one of the most contentious parts of the subject and therefore the part I fought longest and hardest about what I can say on the topic. How long a battery lasts depends on how it is treated. That is especially true of lead acid batteries, which respond much worse to deep cycles and heavy loads compared to lithium, which can at least give the impression of being indestructible. I'll link some useful videos below which look at the lifespan in more detail, but for now here are the most important takeaways that I found. Firstly, with a few exceptions, leisure batteries don't tend to completely fail, but instead the amount of power they will store and deliver will reduce over use. This means that whilst the 100 amp hour wet lead acid may still be technically working after three years, it is probably by then actually only an 80 or 90 amp hour, possibly even less. And you will only be able to use half of that of course. The second thing when purchasing a battery is that the number of cycles stated can be very misleading. A cycle is a discharge and then recharge of the battery, but manufacturers can use different levels of discharge when testing. So unless the depth of discharge, DOD, is clearly stated, then the number of cycles is effectively worthless information. The third takeaway is that for high current applications such as inverters and motor movers, then lead acid will effectively need to use more cycles to deliver the same power as a lithium. Also, it is important not to be misled or given false confidence by views such as it will last if you treat it properly. After camping off-grid for more than a decade, I can guarantee there will, will be times when you have little or no choice but to run the battery to below its recommended discharge. When looking at value, the number of cycles should be taken into account along with the depth of discharge to give the total power that the battery will actually deliver. Assuming the battery has a DOD figure, then use this to determine the amp hours or watts per cycle and then multiply by the number of cycles. Incidentally, if you've watched my video on electrical theory made easy, and I'll put a link above here, then you may realize that lithiums get an additional bonus here. 
Since true power is not amp powers, but actually watts, and watts are related to both the current consumption and the voltage, the fact that lithiums retain a consistent voltage throughout their discharge means that true watts calculations per cycle is actually higher than on a lead acid where the voltage is dropping as the capacity drops. Anecdotally, lead acids can last as little as three years with five or more being deemed to be good going. Usage and having the correct charging equipment is often the most significant factor in how long a lead acid battery will last. Lithiums are new technology, but the science suggests that lifespan is considerably longer than lead acid. All of the realistic tests and experiments that I have researched suggest that lithiums will far outlast any lead acid batteries. When it comes to cost, standard wet lead acid batteries are the lowest priced with a typical 110 amp hour battery ranging from about 90 to 130 pounds. AGM batteries range in price from the upper end of standard wet, wet batteries, rising to about double the price. Anecdotally, AGM batteries can provide a longer service life than wets that is broadly in line or better than their cost ratio. The additional cost of AGM batteries is probably therefore worthwhile, but mainly for the safety, low maintenance and ability to deliver somewhat higher currents. Gel batteries offer similar benefits to AGM and certainly the models I found have a higher stated number of cycles. However, they are generally harder to source and are significantly more expensive than AGMs and several suppliers I researched actually indicated that the cost to benefit ratio of gel versus AGM does not typically justify the additional expense. In the UK, the National Caravan Council, the NCC, has actually introduced a leisure battery verification scheme to make selection of suitable quality batteries easier. For off-grid use, batteries of class A are recommended. Whilst a high quality lead acid battery will last longer, the capacity drops almost in a linear fashion over time. So by the midpoint of its life, it is likely to be delivering significantly less power. So finally, we come to lithium batteries, the price of which can vary widely. The lowest cost 110 amp hour lithium battery I could find in the UK was about 550 pounds. The most expensive was just over £1,100, and that was actually for a 100 amp hour. Now, this price difference is partly marketing and branding, of course. However, you should note that whilst lead acid batteries are very much a single manufactured component, lithium batteries, in comparison, are actually a self contained system comprising of lithium cells, cell connectors, a battery management system, temperature sensors, overload and short circuit protection systems cables to connect all of these components, and of course, the outer box itself. Now, a look online at somewhere like Alibaba shows how all of these components are readily available at a wide range of specifications, qualities, and of course, price. This gives the assemblers of lithium batteries wide leeway in not only the choice of components that they use, but also how they assemble them. Even if quality components are used, inappropriate assembly can drastically change both the effectiveness, longevity, and even safety of the final product. Almost any small manufacturer with basic assembly facilities could source components and manufacture lithium leisure batteries. For this reason, it makes sense to ensure that you source lithium batteries only from reputable suppliers rather than simply going for the lowest cost possible. Also, whilst there are drop-in lithium replacement batteries widely available, you may still need to invest in additional charging equipment for lithium batteries, and the same can be true in AGM and gels. So it's worth checking that out before making an investment. In terms of physical size and weight, almost all of the batteries I researched had near identical dimensions. Though if, like us, your battery is under the floor, then you may find that the lower height limit restricts your choice when looking for a good deal. Weight-wise, all of the lead acid batteries were of similar weight between 23 and 26 kilos. Lithiums, however, were around half that weight at between 10 and 14 kilos. How your battery delivers power can be a more important differentiator than cost in some use cases. Both AGM and gels can handle higher current draws than standard wet lead acid batteries. So if you need to use high current devices such as motor movers or inverters, then they make more sense than a standard wet battery. However, it's worth noting that all lead acid batteries suffer from what is known as the Perkert effect. 
Simply put, this means that due to its chemistry, a lead acid battery can provide more power if drawn slowly over a longer period of time. Or to put it the other way around, subjecting a lead acid battery to a high current drain will actually reduce the capacity of the battery more than the actual power consumed. Lithium batteries of course have a completely different chemistry and so do not really suffer from the Perkert effect, which means that they can still deliver similar total capacity when used for high or low current purposes. The other significant difference in lithium versus lead acid is the voltage delivered. A lead acid's battery voltage will slowly drop over time. This gives an indication of its remaining capacity, but that can also cause issues when powering devices which require the higher full voltage. I'm sure we have all experienced slightly dimmer lights or slow water pumps when the battery is getting low. Lithium batteries will deliver at or close to their designed maximum voltage all of the way up to 80 or even 90 or so percent discharge. At this point it drops quickly and as previously mentioned the built-in management circuits will then turn it off altogether to protect the battery. This is why lithiums tend to deliver closer to the stated capacity whilst lead acids suffer insufficient voltage and also potentially damage the battery as they reach around 50% of the remaining capacity. Similar to power usage, lithiums and to slightly lesser extent AGM batteries can be charged much faster than wet batteries. This is of particular importance when using solar power to recharge, as full use can then be made of good weather to recharge a depleted battery as fast as possible whilst the sun is available. In conclusion, for moderate usage and low current draws, then standard wet lead acid batteries are the lowest cost investment. However, when life expectancy is taken into account, AGMs become a better cost option and they are also somewhat better for delivering medium to higher currents. When we start to take the actual power available that each battery types provide, then lithiums become roughly equivalent to two of any of the other types of batteries because of their ability to deliver consistent voltage throughout the entire power delivery. So when we combine the life expectancy and the actual power delivery, then to have a specific number of watts available for a specific number of years, then lithiums can potentially be less than half the cost of true equivalent lead acid battery setup. So if you have the money to make the upfront investment, then lithium makes a lot of sense. Had they been available when we started caravanning over 16 years ago, I suspect we would still actually have the same battery today and have had a more reliable power source throughout. It is, however, the sort of investment that makes more sense on paper than actually impacting your day-to-day -day finances. If you stay off-grid a lot, or if weight is more critical, or if you wish to run high current devices such as inverters to provide home comforts like microwaves whilst off-grid, then I would imagine that lithium is the only real sensible option. Personally, for the number of days that we stay off-grid at any one time and the seasons in which we do most of our camping, I'm still on the fence about lithium for my personal use. As you will see from the previous spreadsheet modelling, I'll put a link up here above again, that we did, then a full capacity 110 amp hour battery does make off-grid self-sufficiency much more reliable. I suspect that when my current battery needs replacing, then I will most likely take the plunge and swap to lithium or maybe before, who knows. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you have, then please hit that like button. And if you are interested in seeing more of the videos that I make, then do please consider subscribing to my channel. But most of all, thanks for watching.